Thank you, Mike. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Daniela Garcia Moreno. I'm a sustainability planner with the Northern Middlesex Council of Governments, and this is another workshop and a series of workshops that we've been hosting um, for about the last eight months on clean energy and regionalization efforts in the NEMCOG region. Um, for those of you, oh, actually a brief overview of the workshop today. So we are going to start out with uh, some introductions, both to NEMCOG as well as the panelists that we have um, assembled. Um, then we'll go into a panel discussion. We have a, a couple of questions that we'll, we'll be guiding us through, but um, we'll also have an opportunity for questions. And we really want this to be uh, more of a best practice sharing and an experience sharing between our communities. Um, then we'll go into a net zero consulting presentation uh, with John Snell, who's joining us today. Um, and we'll wrap up with a technical assistance discussion, uh, an opportunity for additional questions um, and some sort of next steps for this regional sustainability work. So for those of you who may not be familiar with our organization, we are the Northern Middlesex Council of Governments. Um, we're one of 13 regional planning agencies in the Commonwealth. We're governed by a policy board of local appointed and elected officials. And we provide technical assistance uh, across a variety of um, topics. So ranging from transportation, housing, sustainability, open space, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to member communities. And you can see the member communities here um, on this map. Uh, we're based in Lowell and we serve the eight surrounding communities. Um, this workshop has been funded as a part of the Department of, Department of Energy Resources Regional Energy Planning Assistance Grant. Um, which strives to provide assistance uh, for regional community, I mean, green communities um, compliance. So it's a, a program under the Green Communities Division of the Department of Energy Resources, um, as well as assistance with net zero planning um, and overall greenhouse gas emissions reductions goals in across the Commonwealth. Um, so the goals for today are to learn about regional sustainability achievements, uh, what our communities have done to date, and what they might have planned for the future. Um, through that discussion, we're going to try to find opportunities for collaboration on some of these sustainability initiatives um, and discuss additional needs for advancing sustainability. And of course, it's also another opportunity for our communities to come together and meet other people that might be working on similar initiatives and again share those best practices or work together so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, oh, actually, now I will um, introduce our panelists today. So we are joined by Turumi Okano, co-chair of the Pepperell uh, Climate Change Committee. Uh, Sue Thomas, the sustainability coordinator for the town of Westford and Carlisle for now, but <laughs> soon to be Westford exclusively. So we're lucky to have her. And Badri Upaliapan, who is the chair of the Chelmsford Clean Energy and Sustainability Committee. Um, so I can let them introduce themselves in a little more detail. You can you know, tell us what you do if this isn't your, your day job, and then we can get started with more of the questions. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Tarumi Okano. As Danielle mentioned, I am the co-chair of the Pepperell Climate Change Committee. I've been in this position for three months, and it's a very exciting place to be. Um, my background is in chemical engineering. However, um, I moved into marketing, so now, now for my day job, I'm a, I'm a marketing consultant, but I've always been passionate about sustainability. Um, I did my master's thesis on capturing mercury from coal combustion food gases, so it's always been an area that I've been passionate about, and um, yeah, I'm really excited to help move Pepperell forward in that direction. Thank you. Hi. I'm Sue Thomas. I'm currently the sustainability coordinator shared between Westford and Carlisle, um, paid through a grant um, to the state. And I'm lucky enough that the town of Westford has decided to fund partially through a grant and partially through the budget, um, the position starting in August full time in Westford. 
Carlisle, meanwhile, ha is has also set aside money for sustainability planning. It's just not a full time position. Um, I come to this position after a couple of years on the Westford Clean Energy and Sustainability Committee, where we did a greenhouse gas inventory and developed the our Westford climate roadmap, which is now in version two. Um, after being workshopped around town to a variety of government and um, local groups to under, get their feedback. And it now is come, it shortly will come before the select board for hopefully for endorsement and further prioritization. Um, my background, I come uh, started my career in government service in management consulting um, in the new field then of automating a lot of government systems. I moved into marketing with Kraft when they were bringing all of their new kinds of cheese on board and that kind of marketing. So that was a new venture then. And then I moved into healthcare and I did consulting as HMOs and hospitals were restructuring for managed care. So I've always been in sort of the changing forefront of industry changes. I took a great deal of time off to raise my son and was very involved in local government and boards throughout that time and sort of and segued through the solid waste and environmental arena picking up some gig work with the Middlesex Conservation District, which is a county level government organization, which is pretty rare in Massachusetts, and picked up some of the agricultural and sustainable and regenerative ideas through that. So, and my degree is in economics, so I have a kind of a broad background, which is good because our climate plans are really broad and um, involve a lot of that skill set. So um, I find myself drawing on all those skills and, and learning and working, and I'm really excited to have so many great peers to, to learn and work with. So thank you for the opportunity tonight. Thank you so much, Sue. Audrey. Hi, um, so my background, um, is electrical and electronics engineering with a uh, management um, degree um, added to it from Tufts um, locally here. I've been um, with about 18 years, um, just shy of 18 years, a resident of Chelmsford, and I was um, um, involved in Chelmsford's very first initiative into the integrated community back when with. Uh, um, being the volunteer director for the Greener Chelmsford Initiative back then, um, started by a uh, select board member of that, which was then Eric Dalberg at that particular point. Campaigned around town for businesses to try and recognize a few businesses to take action, very specifically there. Um, so I think as a, uh, I also have a, uh, a solar panel, and I've been uh, Net zero from electricity home usage perspective, specifically for the past six and a half years, give or take. So, zero and I've got some balance left. Um, I'm being currently being in the process of uh, considering putting geothermal instead of an air source heat pump uh, as a down source. And one of my good friends or somebody else on the panel or, or on the Zoom call right now is trying to convince me to get there. Not an EV car. So, <laughs> I've been the chair and committee member for the uh, Chelmsford uh, Clean Energy Committee now for a couple of years, um, year and a half. It was established to be in 21 October. So thank you so much, everyone. And thank you again for participating in this panel. Um, I think your, your broad experiences um, really speak to um, the need for a breadth and a depth of, um, of experience and knowledge to really be able to participate in sustainability and take on these, what I think is one of the biggest challenges that we're, we're facing. Um, so I'm really excited that you're all so active in this work and um, excited to, to see where you take your communities. So um, we will start with our first question. Um, and you've spoken to this a little bit already, but what progress has your community made um, toward developing and implementing um, net zero plans or other energy related sustainability measures? And we can start whoever wants to take it away and then we can <laughs> jump around. You wanna go first this time? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, 
the clean energy and sustainability, Westford has done a lot of, um, I, I guess I want to back up and, and say even before um, there was um, a clean, clean energy and sustainability committee, and before we started talking about net zero, there was an energy committee in Westford and a commitment um, to become a green community, to um, create uh, the um, community aggregation plan that's been in existence. Um, to start thinking about electric vehicles, um, although we were not ready to purchase them, there was discussion going on, and um, also to participate in the municipal vulnerability um, uh, plan, the plans. So those things were already in motion. So Westford had a really strong foundation. Carlisle also had a strong foundation, but in a different way. Carlisle had created a master plan that embedded sustainability in all of its goals. So, and they also had had an energy committee and had become a green community prior to my taking on the position of sustainability coordinator for the town. But the, the energy committee had kind of lapsed and in Westford it had also kind of tailed off a little bit as committees do over time. And um, so the, resolutions in town to to move toward net zero then reinvigorated that. So the, the Clean Energy and Sustainability Committee, um, the Energy Committee morphed into Clean Energy and Sustainability Clean Energy and Sustainability Committee in Westford. And um, over the past year, the Energy Committee reconstituted as the Environmental Sustainability Committee. Um, but the towns were in two different places in that um, Westford has had a standing committee for two years. Carlisle's committee didn't get rolling and really until fully seated until November of this past year. Mm -hmm. So in Westford, we already had done the greenhouse gas inventory and had the, the climate plan. In Carlisle, they have a very intensive work plan that includes building off a net zero plan that's been there in the past but needs to be updated. And so it's been very interesting um, seeing where each town has set its priorities and the kind of communication that goes on because there are actually three organizations in Westford. There's a strong advocacy group that's organized as Westford Climate Action. There's the appointed committee, and now there's my position. Whereas in Carlisle, my position started, the master plan was done, so the select board was on board. The, the, my, uh, my position came in and then the committee became established and the advocacy group and the committee are, while there are a lot of people involved, they're trying to build the advocacy group. So towns do it in different ways, but it I think takes as many hands and hearts involved in this work as possible. Um, so, the, but the official path, I guess, is, a, is going to differ from town to town. Um, but hopefully the progress is the same. Okay. Um, so I would say that in Pepperell, the path, we're, we're pretty new with the net zero plan, but the beginning path is similar to Carlisle in that in 2020, Pepperell had created a master plan and they had incorporated some of those um, carbon reduction efforts within that plan. And so that's actually when we started um, thinking about the municipal aggregation that we are getting ready to file soon, as well as we started planning for building a solar farm on our landfill. So those are already underway. And then the Climate Change Committee was actually created in order to give someone the responsibility for those action items <laughs> in the master plan. So that's kind of how, um, how we came about and where we are with our net zero plan is um, we're working very closely with Daniela's support, um, leaning heavily on her to help us. Um, right now we're finalizing the scope of work for our net zero plan. So, um, yeah, I'd love to hear, you know, more from those who've already gone through this process. And um, I think another big piece is um, that Danielle also helped us with is educating the 
people in the town, the residents of Pepperon, what does that even mean? What does carbon zero mean? Why should we even care? So I feel like we're just sort of like starting to get off the ground and, and get going. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of where we're at. It's an exciting road ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, dream. Um, Chemsworth's been um, in the historical sense from a municipal perspective, I think from 2008, nine, somewhere thereabouts, I think uh, down is, the municipal <clears throat> section has been doing good work in terms of moving along with energy efficiency um, over the years, getting to clean energy. Libraries put in solar panels, the schools got solar panels, and the whole town is municipal operations, the police nearly 100% of not 100% of ready um, clean energy um, contributed. In terms of uh, the committee itself, we have completed our draft report of the greenhouse gas reporting or emissions scanning, um, which we have a number for at this particular point. We love the MAPC metro, um, what is it, metropolitan area planning, planning council. council's yes. uh, Four point um, four big quadrant um, initiative as a good framework. Mm -hmm. uh, we've literally adopted that, and most of the critical points there um, are the four reaches that we have to do. There are a few other off streets that we are going around with, it, but in each of these areas, um, we can talk about it a bit. Um, I think from uh, the big portion is buildings very specifically, which is the biggest contributor. Um, we wrote some grant uh, grant proposal to Mass Safe to be able to communicate your low income or uh, effective, you know, for, for low income population to get to energy efficiency or just get them to do Mass Safe. We are in the process of selecting our um, HBC contractor and, and see what we can do to begin that campaign, hopefully before the fall starts. Um, that's from the building side. We are also looking to uh, initiate discussions around uh, what I would call is the electrification of heating, which is the big state push that needs to happen. Uh, we're trying to design the campaign for that and think about how best to achieve that. Um, there are certain challenges, and I think we'll talk about some of those in the later part of the tech uh, discussions. In terms of the clean energy um, supply itself, um, Chemsford does the aggregation program and is at current state default levels. Um, we did um, try to increase that number and we were not necessarily successful um, in, that, in getting that um, initiative, basically. Um, in terms of um, zoning, uh, one of the things we have initiated as a trial balloon at this point is we work with your grant, partially also funded by um, Chemsford. Uh, Side so code funds. We work with Westman and Samson to put together a sort of a questionnaire um, that we could introduce into the planning board process itself, mm -hmm. so that when planning board gets new projects coming back, they have to sort of fill out a few questions around sustainability. And this allows the committee to get engaged, give feedback, and or have discussions around electrification, solar siting. And Things of that nature, just at least have a conversation and, and try to gently move that. And planning board has taken an action item that they, when they get back to the next master plan revision, they'll update that to include sustainability. I think this is the other point to notice. Um, so that's one aspect there. I think from a transportation segment, um, that's the biggest challenge at this point. I think really between zoning and transportation. I think that's where the boundary of the long-term impact can happen from how I from my limited understanding of how we have to have office mm -hmm. for the scope of my office. So I think that that would be the main that's great. Thank you. Um, for those of you on in the room or online that may not know about the the resource that Badri is referencing. Um, it's the Metropolitan Area Planning Council Net Zero Playbook, um, and it's essentially a guide that provides uh, a suite of resources and, and example strategies uh, that towns can adopt, towns or cities can adopt um, in the development of their own net zero action plans. Um, and it's divided in four sections, so it's buildings, energy supply, zoning, and transportation, 
Um, and it provides a really, I think, actionable framework for drafting strategies as well as um, implementing them. And I think John might touch on that a little more later. So um, we'll hold off. And we also, um, this series was developed by Arlington during their, um, or with Arlington and during the development process of their net zero action plan. Um, and we have a workshop recording um, from our last regional clean energy workshop where we heard from the sustainability manager at Arlington about their net zero action plan. So you can find that on our YouTube account and learn more. Um, so I think we heard that, you know, there's, there's really a lot of players involved in the implementation and kind of development of both net zero action strategies and other sustainability initiatives, and that, that can be challenging at times. Um, but what are key takeaways that you've learned, um, from these efforts to develop or implement energy and sustainability initiatives in your communities? I have several takeaways and I might occupy the entire field of meeting that way. But I think I think um maybe just given recent experiences, however, um well community education is an important piece. I think a lot of um leadership, community leadership education or awareness needs to be made to happen as to how to make decisions or what are the trade-offs. Concepts in finance and or policy need to be figured out so that they understand first order where the get quick gains can happen and support um, very specific effort. I think the challenging part is marrying state policy or state um, guidance or wishful actions and translating them to ground actions is the other piece is, is there are there are disconnects in how resources are aligned mm -hmm. if you take an example of let's say electrification of whole heating do we have enough trained people or contractors supply information versus disinformation versus outdated information. Those kinds of things need to be more coordinated in the area of the Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Lisa, mother topics for others. You want to go next? Sure. Um, so, so one thing that I learned as we were going through the greenhouse gas inventory and then creating our net zero plan is Pepperl is very unique in that it's very rural. <laughs> and so actually 55% of the um, emissions actually comes from transportation, people driving their cars. Another 30% comes from residential. That's like almost 80, 85, 90% of our emissions. And so basically, we're saying, hey, he pumps in EVs, right? But we can't demand people do that. And so, um, you know, we have to, that's why, as Badri was saying, education is so important because, you know, most people aren't going to switch over unless it's economically favorable, right? And in some cases it is, in some cases it, it isn't. Um, and also it's... Um, yeah, it's not something like I think businesses is like 1.3% of our carbon emissions. So it's it's difficult when you don't have control really over right those things that are releasing the highest amount of carbon emissions for the town. On the other side, um, another thing that's unique is that we have a lot of forest and open land in Pepperell. And so in addition to the typical um, things that you typically have in your in your net zero plan. We are actually trying to figure out um, how we can maybe use our trees or open land as sort of the net zero in our net zero calculation, just because a lot of our land is natural land that does carbon sequestration. So that's kind of a unique um, thing that we're pretty proud of the amount of nature that we have. And so there's a lot of conservation efforts going into our plan as well as the typical reducing carbon emissions. So. That's kind of, yeah, where we're at. So, okay. So, yeah. So um, the natural resources piece is 
really important. That's something that the state recognizes that we won't get to net zero without all that sequestration capacity and helping to uh, increase it and protect it. Um, so that is part of both Carla and Westford's planning. And there are algorithms, the Nature Conservancy has one, um, and in the greenhouse gas inventory that MACP does, there is a, a piece that takes into account your forested land, not to the detail of the Nature Conservancy algorithm, but there is, is a whole analysis pursuit you can do there in terms of quantifying your current sequestration capacity and your future mm -hmm. sequestration capacity. Um, and Carlisle was obviously very excited about this being a highly forested uh, town, although Westford is also. However, the analysis indicates that it by no means will offset action in the other sectors. Mm -hmm. So it isn't a reason to rest on your laurels. It has to be part of the plan, but um, it can't be the only plan. <laughs> <laughs> Although, in jokingly, some people say, can't we just all gather together and like figure out kind of a cap and trade type of system? Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that is entirely unrealistic, but it doesn't allow us to not take action in our individual communities, even though we may have that competitive advantage in, the, mm -hmm. in our forested land. The challenge of having different sectors in Westford, it was a shock to find out a third of our emissions comes from the business community. So we weren't prepared for that. We think of ourselves as a bedroom community. We were prepared for the fact that the municipal slice would be relatively small and that in, in Carlisle, it's, it's almost vanishingly small. Um, and therefore, it, as a tool and as an example, it's really important, but that makes a job like ours at the table very different from your normal government job because our customers are everyone, and we're more. We have to be outward facing, even as we're servicing and working with change internally, which can be very challenging. And so that outreach effort is is essential in understanding how your town reaches all those communities, uh, particularly with buildings, which is the state focus this year. Really, and probably for future years, but it's definitely a very strong focus right now. Um, but transportation also builds off of that because it leads into economic development and how you're going to grow or not as a town or, or possibly shrink if you don't have charging in the right places. And I think it's a very complex area where the state may not have thought it through before they <laughs> put things together and that that's leading towns to stumble over hurdles about how they cost their charging infrastructure and how they charge for charging and who are, who's charging. And so I really see that as an opportunity for regional organizations to help towns um, figure out how to grow their charging infrastructure and their EV fleets in concert with the uptake and demand for those things, mm -hmm. because that's not an individual town thing. And then with regard to outreach, in my personal opinion, every town shouldn't be struggling, and it is a struggle. If you talk, I've talked to a number of, of the towns in, in MAPC and also some in, in MIMCOG. The website outreach can be a big expense and, and labor intensive effort trying to keep everything up to date and trying to run all these events. But a lot of the information, not the events, but the information about grants and resources overlaps from town to town. So we're happily copying each other, but it would be great if the state just created a website, <laughs> kept it up to date, and we could all access it. And then we could link in the custom pieces that are appropriate for each of our municipal or city governments. And so I would really, you know, that's that's kind of been something that's been slowly dawning on me because I'm I'm happy to write website material and I'm happy to write newsletters, but um, we are in many ways trying to do exactly the same thing from town to town. So so that is an area where we have a labor savings opportunity um, so that we can focus on the initiatives in our own that are unique to our own towns. Um, so that outreach effort is is really important, and I do find that having people sitting in different roles 
is really helpful to um, promoting that education effort because it's not just me saying something. And one of, I think the most influential way of doing that is ha we all know that uh, there are other towns and other households, even within our towns, like my colleague right here, <laughs> who could do a house tour of his net zero house. And I think there's nothing more persuasive in it, and research actually shows this, in a confusing new environment than having neighbor talk to neighbor and demonstrate a successful experience. Now, are all of them going to be successful? Successful, You know, we have to wrestle with that too. Mm -hmm. um, Westford and Carlisle are looking at partnerships to help get the word out with mass safe vendors and possibly with Abode, who is a more of a consulting uh, uh, vendor or with um, the Heat Smart Alliance, which is a great volunteer organization. Abode has already started to get overwhelmed and I expect Heat Smart Alliance will. And they offer that technical experience about um, heat pump success that we're all looking for that the mass save firms really aren't as experienced in and where we haven't built that technical expertise in the state, I think we're gonna have to start, if we wanna make progress in the shorter term, we need to start drawing on the great expertise in our each of our municipalities to share that with each other. And that that is a community organizing type of function um, that, I, that I hope to do more of. Um, I like to Sue's points, right? In, in, in eight of those steps, very specifically, um, either state, mass save, and in fact, we failed an opportunity to get it right into the uh, House and uh, Senate um, transportation utilities energy uh, mission. Multiple uh, laws that are going in today. But to Sue's points, is, is education and resources for contractors or training them on even uh, in batches and requiring certification processes that require and say anybody who's coming up for renewal from 2025 or something at a state level needs to go through the process of saying we're not going to get ready with doing a total cost of analysis between a um, an older system versus a heat pump system and getting that type of thing, getting those resources updated, um, just having neighbor to neighbor. Uh, one of the ideas that I've just recently proposed to a builder who's building something in Chelmsford is to hold uh, a builder's day open house when they have built their first structure, open it up on a Saturday, wherever it is, and invite the other tradespeople to come in and say, here's something that you can go look for. This is how the new building standards work out. Or this is how they, we are building something that's more efficient. And even to this range of, you know, people say, I'm going to put just electric cooktops and stuff, hold them, demonstration of, you know, various kinds of goods being done at, is a fantastic way to get brownie points, certifications, or a, a, a lot of recognition for a builder or whoever that is to keep that community organized much, much more so that the trades are able to catch on by looking at examples on how best to do it because then they can see better practices and fundamentally better practices. I'd like to give a, t a shout out to our libraries and sort of some interdisciplinary um, sharing that's going on. So the Mass DEP um, has a, a grant program that probably most municipalities participate in that give you points for different waste reduction initiatives. And one of them is the Library of Things. And the Library of Things in both Westford and Carlisle contain meters for measuring energy use in your town. So you can borrow that. You don't need to have that tool. In Carlisle, they have an induction cooktop. So you can borrow the induction cooktop and try it out. So that's an opportunity where there are grant funds that can support some, that the town may have, where it can support its library of things in your library, and you're building with structure, you know, plans and structures you already have. But that gives you the ability to leverage community tools mm -hmm. for people to explore um, without making a large 
or any financial commitment in those things. So um, it doesn't have, I guess, you know, we're talking about some really big things, but there are also some small quick hitting, but effective things that, that where the government programs overlap, but I don't think they realize that they can advertise them that way. So we need to do it for them. <laughs> Great. Well, it sounds like there's already some some sharing of um, resources, and this is really exciting. I think um, this is kind of the purpose of this type of um, this type of conversation. Um, as far as like additional support, what more will your community need to implement um, or develop additional goals, and how can NIMCOG be leveraged. And you've already spoken a little bit to this, um, whether that's providing support with like infrastructure or outreach, are there additional ways that the NIMCOG community um, or NIMCOG itself as an organization can step in to sort of fill in the gaps? Um, what does that look like? Um, I would say for us, definitely the, I know there's been a lot of talk about education but I think um, just working to, because there's so many aspects of sustainability. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we just need so many different, we just need a lot more resources, I guess. Um, we need more volunteers in order to make, you know, it successful um, and actually make net zero happen um, in Pepperell. And then I think the other thing that we're still kind of stuck on is, you know, what creative solutions can we come up with to help those who, you know, like can't afford an EV or can't afford a heat pump, like how do we ensure economic justice in our implementation or solution? So we're gonna need some, some support or at least ideas around that. Yeah, I think the environmental justice piece has been something that I've really been trying to bring to the forefront of both the development of these types of plans, but also just conversations generally um, with our communities. Um, that's also in open space and recreation plans, really across the board. It's something that's um, very important to achieve a transition. Sustainability can't be sustainability without that equity component. So definitely agree and, and hope to see and be able to provide more assistance with that. That's great. Um, I think one way I, I see us trying to do that is through figuring out how to reach those people. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we always know how to do that. We know how to reach a segment of them who require other public services, but there are a lot of people who sort of fall between that and, and you know, having, I don't wanna say unlimited resources, but having the resources to make decisions to buy expensive capital things on their own. Um, and I, I think that's looking, going through the lens of housing and, and the state is trying to implement or has provided resources for programming through how, different types of housing, but it's figuring out how to let those landlords know. I mean, I've had business people call me up not knowing about our community aggregation and being thrilled. And I've had people in apartments call me up and go, why do I not have access to this? And I am like, well, it's because your landlord doesn't realize that they should be signed up. So I've started talking to a couple of HOAs and trying to find out who the management is. And But one person can't do that. So I think we have to figure out a vehicle for getting that information. The resources are there, but getting the information to the people that the resources are there. And um, whether that's through our building departments, um, with the new MBTA um, initiatives that affect many of us at the table or um, through your affordable housing committee or, or how, which I work very closely with and I'm fortunate to have some volunteers on that committee who are kind of tracking and I'm helping but I don't have to know every single program because there are a lot, at, there is a mass save program for every building in the state. So there is a mass save program for those folks. And, and the federal programming for EVs is also built in. They're not quite implemented yet, but, but built in for buying used EVs and things that target some of those communities. But um, again, it's a, it's a problem of, of outreach and kind of thinking about government a little bit differently in, in that sphere. Yes. I think there are several ways we can accelerate this, but 
it may not be the place, but I'll speak it out at least for Nankai if it chooses to accept the mission in some ways. But I think uh, between uh, vocational tech and high schools, at least, there needs to be a, a reason, some kind of a awareness, research project, uh, whatever it be, so called, a, a, an ability to have the future citizens and the ones that will own the problem significantly mm -hmm. to participate, to come up with action plans and, and take action. That's a fantastic place we can do. So, a lot of kids will love that as an opportunity to research or a social science or a data science project or a community service project. And depending on the schools, they can go to neighboring towns and do that. Well, um, part of the Inflation Reduction Act says that you can earn, and I'm gonna not remember the right certification, but $300 per vocational tech kid who gets certain credentialing. Correct. So there already is some. And so we need, we need to capture But we that. need to let people know that they can get it's not, it. It's not just full tech, but it's also also the regular. Engineering. Uh, and uh, the regular high schools at least we have to look at that. Um, the other thing that I think is, as this has been discussed, but sustainability is a very complex, multi-dimensional part of balancing each one and going along, right? It's not a single linear one, two, three, four thing. So as I said, awareness in public leadership of the complexities needs to happen. I would always make it a, a, a mandatory post like ethics. <laughs> because it's the ethics of not passing you know, taking decisions that impact future generations mm -hmm. so it's an ethical longer term duration not just looking at the i, I believe in uh, the, the phrase the good ancestor and, and, and financial terms of discounts and people don't understand that necessarily very easily it's a complex subject so concept that i idea on but it's really been saying you know, how do you make that so once that philosophy is embedded the fact that schools come in, the fact that you have um, public leadership in the positions of committees, I still think the long, big pull that's most <clears throat> narrowly problem to solve, um, when I take the diversity of communities that we have, solving between how Westford as a community is, as a Chemsford, as a Pepper, as a Carlisle is, you're going to have to figure out zoning, transportation, not clusterization within each town, so to speak, and say, hey, I want all the resources to my town itself, and I want to bring businesses just to my town. Mm -hmm. It's got to be about how do you look ahead, 25 years ahead? What are the models of development across the world that we have to think about? It's a very tough challenge. I'm not saying it's an easy uh, mm -hmm. problem. But unless that awareness and that pivot needs to happen now, we're not going to be able to make any meaningful EV change. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just going to be another EV, at best an EV, instead of a fossil fuel car, well, EVs, roads, um, but other communities or countries or cities are looking at making an accessible transportation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about uh, you know, environmental justice, you have to think about people, low income people having to travel very far to work or to reach services. Mm -hmm. How do you bring that services and replan it, mm -hmm. right? Breaking that bounds across the region, so to speak, not saying that all the grocery stores are clustered in one location, so to speak, mm -hmm. but nobody can reach out. And, you know, an elderly person at 75 may not be able to drive mm -hmm. or cannot drive, mm -hmm. or they are in fixed income or something about mm -hmm. that. How do you manage that? Mm -hmm. So, this, I think that is a long pull in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. at least in our community, or the diversity that we have. And we've got to pay attention to that a lot. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be the critical long term pull because everything else is a quick, uh, not necessarily it's a quick, it's a relatively easier. Solve. Mm -hmm. You can do distributed solar. You can run a campaign with a policy for um, heat pumps, but there are, that's one big thing. The other area that you could look at, uh, which I tried a bit but didn't work out, is bringing together local financial institutions 
to help work the building transformation. How do you create financial vehicles and programs in conjunction with retirement policies or in conjunction with new home sales or other things? Can you bring something together about upgrading homes? That's it. There's a, there's a place I want to fill that. And if you want to host a financial series with JBCU and Enterprise Bank and Northern Middlesex Bank or whoever else is still around, Santander Bank. <laughs> we should go ahead and do that. I think that's important to bring that way for enablement for people at the bottom. Yeah, it's like you said, it's a it's an intergenerational and um issue that requires multiple lenses across so many sectors that there's really a lot of ground to cover. And um, you know, NEMCOG, we hope to to be able to cover as much of that as we can. We also um it's kind of part of the purpose of these of these uh, workshops is you know, we don't have all the expertise and um that's also where outside partnerships come in and where your own unique perspectives and your communities comes in as well. Um, so I am cognizant of the time, and I think with all these really great perspectives, um, we took up more than I was expecting. So if you have questions, um, please write them down, save them till the end. We'll have an opportunity to ask questions for both our panelists um, and our presenter, John Snell, then. Um, for now, we're going to transition uh, to... John Snell, who is a Net Zero Planning Consultant, and he's going to provide us with a pres presentation on some of the um, efforts that he's been involved in. So we can keep learning more about kind of this specifically um, decarbonization and net zero um, or net zero efforts in the state. So, John, you can take it away. Great. Uh, this has been fascinating to listen and listen to because every community that I've worked with has gone through similar issues and it's always exciting to hear solutions being suggested. And uh, uh, Danielle, if, if people want to ask a few questions right now, I can reduce my presentation from what's been allocated to a little bit less. Would you like to do that or just keep moving forward? Um. We'll take, I appreciate the offer. Thank you. I will take you up if there are, <laughs> we'll take two pressing questions. Um, and then um, I think we we should keep it moving. We do have some, a little more wiggle room towards the end. So I don't want to um, cut your presentation short either, because I'm sure you have a lot of great information to share. So um, if our Zoom folks or anyone here in person, if you have any questions uh, for Zoom people, you can either raise your hand um, or type into the um, the chat and we'll read out your question or here. Yes, Jay. Hi, my name is Jay Mason. Mm -hmm. I'm with the Lowell Sustainability Council. Great. And Lowell last week decided to move ahead with something that had received a lot of advocacy in the community in the past couple of years, really, uh, to establish a sustainability department. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that's really key to doing the outreach that I hear the panel is talking about and the, the de-siloing that I see in the various efforts that are surrounding the community. And so I just quickly was wondering, obviously Westford has a sustainability uh, uh, coordinator, and I wondered if, if Petrol has uh, something equivalent, and I was also wondering about Chelmsford. Um, yeah, so for Petrol, that is one thing that we've been trying very hard to do is get a paid sustainability coordinator. And because we are such a small town, we're even happy with sharing someone, you know, with, with the other towns. But so far, we do not have any, like, paid position for sustainability, which is definitely a challenge. And so your efforts are done through what? part of city government. So we are, um, yeah, so we report to the select board as the climate change committee. And um, basically most of the activities go through us. And are you town uh, uh, established? Like in Lowell, the Sustainability Council is an, a, a manager appointed group of, of, of uh, volunteers. Yes, it's the same. It's an appointed um, group as well. And, and uh, 
In Chemsford, yeah, but uh, so Chemsford Clean Energy Sustainable Committee is town meeting mandated as an advisory committee to select vote, to advise select vote for uh, strategies and techniques to get to net zero. We also have a sustainability manager who's uh, uh, liaisoned into our committee, as well as takes care of a lot of the um, um, aspects around um, recycling um, and related activities there, quite uh, specific at this point. So the thing I would add is, in my experience networking with others and in my personal experience, the job description for this position has a lot of variations on a theme. So sometimes it's an outgrowth of the solid waste arena, which I believe is the case in Chelmsford. It came out of a, um, a diversion coordinator or, or some other position within the DPW. Sometimes it comes out of an energy pos efficiency position associated with green communities. And the primary focus is on the increasing energy conservation. And so that's the person's focus. Um, those are the two big ones. That's so the a position like mine, which is everything, all, all of the disciplines, um, there are positions like that. Um, Concord started out with one, but now it's sort of they've they've divided into different um, I think it's portioned out across different people within the town mm -hmm. by sector. Um, and I, I think you'll sort of see people by necessity, one full-time job ends up focusing on, on certain things. And hopefully you can hire someone who can transition from priority to priority or pick a focus area and, and stick with that. Um, the, I rely very heavily on, um, experts within the community and experts who sit on the appointed, uh, appointed committee who are really interested in, in electric vehicles or really are part of Heat Smart Alliance and they know about heat pumps and or they they have history with our community aggregation. So um, I'm lucky enough to be able to kind of, even though I'm trying to coordinate, be able to rely on some of that uh, and we have a very long-standing recycling commission that does the work that in, in Lowell, there's a, a, you're very good at solid waste. I have, <laughs> you know, we have a long history of being really good at diversion. Um, so that's, um, you know, it, it sort of still tends to be thought of in a segregated siloed way, which tends to be easier for municipal government because it's familiar. But it gets away from this transformative notion that we have that we're really going through a new industrial revolution. We're really undoing a lot of the miracles of my lifetime and thinking about supply chains and thinking about onshoring and thinking about looking at the food revolution in a new way and thinking about the miracle of plastics in a new way. And so when you start to segregate, I, I, it's it's very effective in the sector that you choose for the municipal government to do that, but it also tends to stay in the municipal government sphere. It's hard. It's still hard for those people to push out into the residential sphere or the business sphere with their activity. Yeah, I think we're really hoping that this department rolls up to the city manager, that it's not part of the energy department. It's not part of solid waste and recycling. It is its own uh, uh, entity that that can parallel on that org chart instead of being you know down a few tiers below it needs to be more uh, and that's involved. what my position is in both towns I report to the town manager as a department head but, but one yeah. of the key questions to be thinking about it is is there a performance metric that is required of that um, person. on a person or I wouldn't say necessarily the person, but at the town management level, administration level, to show a, a pathway to reduce. Well, and also, it's not just a decision, but that, that needs to be a key performance indicator at all, so that it moves down, like, and, and that number as an action is, is done, so that it's not, it doesn't go into a, a labyrinth of, oh, there is X, Y, Z reason why something that doesn't get done or is an advisory that can or cannot be implemented in the next few years because of several things. 
just like accountability is there, it needs to be accountable. Someone has to be accountable for it. And it's part of that description that. Well, I would say yeah. not somebody, everybody needs to be accountable for it. And that's the problem when we make one person accountable for it, then everybody else can say, you know, I don't have to contribute as much. So. Well, I think John is probably waiting to. <laughs> I'll jump in now. This, the sustainability director question is fabulous. And there definitely does need to be a focal person. Uh, so I'm glad that was raised and discussed the way it was. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and run through a few slides and then we can go back to discussion uh, if that works for everyone. That sounds great. Yes. And we have some questions um, in the chat. We'll, we will revisit those um, at the end of uh, John's presentation. And um, just to make sure we have plenty of time for, for more discussion, I think we have a very engaged crowd, which is great. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, this is uh, a lot of what we're talking about is tied to what the state has has uh, brought forward as policy to get to these two uh, carbon reduction standards, 50% by 2030, 85% by 2050. Uh, the chart on the bottom is what the state claims it's already achieved since 1990. And you can see they started really getting some traction in 2005 and then it leveled off again in 2010. Uh, they cleaned up the electrical systems pretty well. I'm afraid the most successful thing was a depression we had in 2008, where people just stopped using energy. Uh, so where it's flattened out, everything is gonna magically get better over the next few years, we hope. Uh, the program that I've been helping out, uh, and I should provide a little, just a quick uh, one minute background who I am. I've been in the energy business for about 45 years now, uh, working for three different companies, either blowing in insulation, uh, cleaning up multifamily buildings, or uh, consulting for cities, towns, and state facilities on what to do, uh, translating technical gobbledygook into English so decision makers could do something uh, rather than just try and struggle with uh, information they couldn't understand. So three uh, planning councils have asked me to help with a program that Massachusetts Department of uh, Energy Resources has run beginning in 2021 to help support individual cities and towns develop a greenhouse gas inventory, do a climate action plan for their buildings and fleets, uh, or help develop, uh, uh, provide supporting documentation for an action plan RFP. And you can see the scale of effort. I believe they will be offering this again uh, this year. It runs for about two years. We're just cleaning up work. And uh, I've done work for nine communities now, and it's been learning by doing uh, for the most part for the greenhouse gas emissions inventory. This, there's a nice little spreadsheet that we fill out and it summarizes the total uh, emissions and it breaks it down to some of the things you've heard already. It's the, it's the buildings. No, no, it's the vehicles. Is it gasoline? Is it diesel? What about off-road, off-waste? Most of these numbers vary a little bit from community to community, but this is what you get from a greenhouse gas inventory. Just uh, what are we starting from? And these numbers are for a community of about 20,000 people. For the Municipal Climate Action Plan, you get a little more detail. Uh, there's about a $10,000 commitment that you can make towards this and every community that I work with decided how much or how little they want to do. But this is a pretty good reflection for what's going on in terms of where the, uh, Focus is in buildings, it's, it's schools, a little bit of library, a little bit of town hall, and it's schools, schools, schools. So you need to really get comfortable with what to do about your schools. For vehicles, for gasoline, it's, it's uh, the police department. For diesel, it's the DPW and fire department and a little bit of other stuff. And this is what we worked with with uh, communities to figure out well, when do you think you might be able to change your, 
your buildings and change your vehicle fleets. And it's going to be really hard to do anything quickly. So you can see a lot of work is put off until later. Uh, hopefully your communities will do better and find ways that you can do things more quickly. But for municipal facilities and vehicles, it's really tough to make anything happen quickly for a couple different reasons. For the community action plan, uh, what we were seeing is that it cost twenty dollars to $40,000 to do a really good community action plan or have some really engaged volunteers to do it. However, in June last year, the state came forward with a 2025-2030 plan. And one of the comments that was made earlier was it's really critical to align yourself with what the state is doing. Uh, and I thought that's that's spot on and I felt the same way. So for the communities I worked with, I said, huh, the state has come forward with a plan for the next five years and, and actually the next two years now for 2025 and uh, five years after that for 2030. Let's figure out how to align ourselves with what the state's doing and let's let's forget about just trying to do a climate action plan. Let's figure out what it means for us. So for an example, these are the four strategies that rise to the top of uh, the state's plan. It's heat pumps, heat pumps, and more heat pumps. Um, we have maybe one shot to try and get the HVAC systems, the heating and the cooling and all that uh, going. So we need to uh, really, when someone's making an upgrade in their building, let's, let's make sure it's not another replacement of what's already there. And they agreed with the statement earlier that this, the, the financing is, is really challenging and we need to find new and expanded ways to, to, uh, to deal with it. And the way this played out for a lot of the communities is we set up a plan for 2025 that said, okay, the state wants to do all these for our community um, what does that actually mean? For a community of 20,000, it meant we need to install two to 3,000 heat pumps by 2025. That's a really big number. We need to do almost the same thing the following year. Uh, but overall, we need to increase the number of buildings that use electricity, hopefully high efficient, uh, high performing electricity really quickly, about 12% uh, market penetration by 2025 and another 12% by 2030. And I'm gonna go through the same thing for vehicles and solar and then wrap things up after that. But that's the basic idea of what we've been doing for an RFP is uh, not actually putting bids out for an RFP, but uh, either allowing larger communities to use the MVP funding, the uh, uh, vulnerability funding that is out there to go ahead and just hire someone to do, help do some, uh, some work. Um, or for the smaller communities, let's just work with what the state's doing and figure out how to align ourselves with them. So for vehicles, um, it's we need to switch out every light duty vehicle to electric. Uh, fuel cells are an option, but there are not many of them. And we might have a couple shots now be between now and 2050 to change vehicles. They change over more quickly than buildings. Boy, these medium and heavy duty trucks, that, that's, that's a nightmare. The uh, Ford says they're not doing anything bigger than a Ford F-150. Uh, they may do fuel cells later. That, that's a problem. And, uh, Fortunately, most uh, people with uh, their electric vehicles are gonna charge them at home, but we still need a lot of uh, EV charging stations. So for, once again, a community of 20,000, they had no electric vehicles in 2017. They've got a couple hundred now. They need 1,500 in a couple of years and they need 7,000 in seven years. Oh, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, is there anything that cities and towns can do? Maybe not, but we can at least focus on the EV, public accessible EV chargers, um, where a lot of these communities are ending up doing, uh, focusing on is how do we get other people to make, to put in EV, public EV charging stations? 
And how do we make things as easy as possible for people to do that? For electricity, uh, pretty simple. We need to buy more clean electricity. In 2017, the uh, 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 percentage of clean electricity in the grid was about 16%. They want to get to about 67% by 2030. So the state is already committed to do a, a big job there. They're supporting offshore wind. They want to get electricity from Canada. Maine's being a little persnickety about that and consistent with what uh, people were saying earlier, this has to be a just transition from a lot of gas being consumed to none, oil from a lot to none, and how do we make uh, the electricity affordable to everyone? And in terms of, there, there are a couple things happening with the electricity sources. Uh, the dark blue is how much in 2018 was fuel, a fossil fuel fired electricity for this community. Uh, the uh, talk about aggregation is fabulous. Please make it 100% renewable for the next uh, 15 to 20 years. That's going to make the difference between uh, what's now being offered by the electric utility companies and municipal utility companies. Uh, and uh, you got to get as much local renewable as possible. It's not going to make too much of a dent, but keep going. And the other thing you'll see is the scale of electricity use increasing while people start converting their cars and their buildings to high efficiency electricity. As part of what I was doing was giving people a heads up. You need to talk to your utility companies. They don't move on a dime either. And uh, what you want to do and what the utility grid can do, there's, there's a big difference. They're pretty good for a few years, but you need to start planning now and talking to the utility companies in your area. Well, how are we going to get this electricity? And some communities are going to have to wait a long time, some a little less. So make sure you understand what you can do before you do all this planning that assumes, oh, we can install this and, and install that. This is uh, a wonderful uh, chart that uh, Amesbury asked me to make for them that shows, well, how's this gonna play out for us? And it has to be uh, a lot of different things, but to meet the state's targets, you can see it's, uh, we, we have to do everything. We have to weatherize buildings and install heat pumps. We have to buy electricity, install EV charging stations, and we have to, purchase le renewable electricity, install a lot of solar PV. And the solar PV is on people's homes, it's in parking lots, and it's on large scale community solar, solar PV installations on the scale of 10 to 100 acre sites that have to be installed. And then, yes, there are battery operated lawnmowers and other things that we should be doing. But this is what you should have an example. This is how one community sees things playing out if they follow the state's current uh, targets and then keep going up through 2050. So here are the four easy steps that everyone needs to do. First thing is leverage some of the uh, Department of Energy Resources funds to just confirm the numbers that you need to uh, hit uh, and this will come up and, and work with Daniela on this. There'll be grants up to about $12,000 probably to mix and match the needs of your community. Um, also, just for those of you who haven't already gone down that path, there's a real delay in getting renewable electricity procurement aggregation. Uh, I've heard some communities waiting a couple of years recently to get approval for their plans. Uh, jump right on the EV charger stations and start talking to your utility companies and ask them, what can you do for us to make sure the grid is going to work, but also uh, lean on them to say, what, what are you doing through the existing mass save plans, your commercial plans where that's appropriate, and what are we going to do together to get to our 2025 and 2030 guidelines? And DOER is going to have something coming out that some of your communities may want to do called the Climate Leader Program. 
it's on hold till the new administration's on board with it. But that may be coming out and it takes the green community program and, and puts it on a slightly different path towards net zero, not just 20% energy efficiency, but uh, what do we need to do to get to net zero? So there are things coming out and that's, that's a, a brief snapshot of the kind of support services that I've been providing to a few communities uh, the last couple of years with the opportunity for uh, your communities to do something similar, uh, to signing up May or June uh, and being able to actually roll this out later this fall, probably. So I'm gonna stop now because that's enough talking from me and mm -hmm. turn it back to you, to Daniela, to orchestrate how you would like to pull the strings and, and lead the discussion. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much, John. Um, and yes, I think you are another great resource for our communities. Um, you have you know wealth of uh, experience in this um, field and uh, seem to be very plugged into state happening. So um, if I may, would be great to share your contact information with um, our attendees today so they can direct any additional questions they might have um, to you as well. That's all right. Absolutely. Excellent. And so we'll go back to our chat. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, we'll go back to our chat since we had a couple of questions there still. Um, so we'll also now take questions for, for John. So again, to our in-person people, if anyone has any question for John or, yes, Sue. <laughs> I'm wondering, John, if you um, have helped communities develop sort of a dashboard for tracking progress, given that the greenhouse gas inventory yeah. isn't really a useful tool to update annually. Yeah. And, it, and in my exploration, exploration, it seems like the sources are really diverse. Have you a method you're willing to share? Yeah, that, that's, uh, thank you for asking that. It's my favorite question and no one ever answers it with the right, the, the right way. The state is required to uh, keep track of things at the state level. And so that will be a source of data. They've actually got a dashboard up now where you can see at the state level going back a couple of years. Uh, I think the regional planning councils need to do it for individual communities. So I think Daniela needs to do that for you. Uh, and I think, and I've been doing. <laughs> well, it won't work if we're not collecting the data at the local level, I don't think. So that's where I was, I was backing us up to like the permitting process and trying to get the mass save vendors, you know, to aggregate, and it may be aggregated in one place and I haven't found it yet, but like trying to take each metric and make sure that it's available so the regional agencies can publish it. Yeah, for the uh, uh, planning uh, councils that I'm working with, I've done that for the communities that I'm working with. So I've updated how many solar PV systems are out there. Uh, DOT is going to have a live dashboard that will tell every community how many they will have uh, how many vehicles they have, how many are battery operated, how many are, so that data will be available in a dashboard. Uh, so I've put together the uh, list of what's really critical for each planning council to keep track of and the data sources they can organize. And, and it, it, I think uh, rather than teach every community have to do it with municipalities having pretty high turnover, uh, and staff and volunteers who are working on this. It, it really is a good rule if they can get support from the state to uh, keep track of a few things and put a really simple dashboard of where we need to install chargers. MVPC, Merrimack Valley Planning Council actually got some grant funding to identify where are the census tracks where we need to, uh, that have the highest priority for uh, EV stations. And that's another example of getting a little support at the community level to help uh, continue to monitor what's going on and help each community focus its attention. Because you're all, uh, I forgot to say, no one's figured this out yet. Uh, I can guarantee you, no one has figured this out. You've got three wonderful presenters at the community level who have done a, uh, some amazing work to get their communities up to some really good levels. We've Collectively, we've never figured it out. 
Um, so I think the planning councils need to provide a little bit of key data that comes from the state with state support uh, from a few key uh, data sources so that you can log on at the municipal level and see how you're doing, but also see how your neighbors are doing and see what solutions they're coming up with and say, oh, um, Chelmsford, you've got 6% uh, battery operated uh, cars. What are you doing right? I've only got 2%. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, planning should be done at the council, council level. The only thing I haven't been able to figure out is commercial heat pump installations yet. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, the, maybe there's a, another way to get to the same thing is that, as I talked about, you know, having a sustainability course for all elected officials as, a, as part of an ethics led course, I think maybe every town should require, or some, I mean, it's not required, but a suggestion would be that at once a year, a town meeting, the report be presented as to what is the reduction at a community level. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to just focus on the municipal gov level, because that's usually the smallest portion, hopefully, otherwise you have an inverted situation. Mm -hmm. But that is already in progress significantly. You can just put it as municipal and a, um, a, uh, a community level and show that progress, how that's happening. And I think the Climate Leader Program is a very good program. I wish it had come out sooner uh, because then it explains core green communities because green communities are sort of jaded out for a long time. Everybody posts under it very clearly, not knowing who's who, where, maybe not three, but maybe maybe five colors there. But at least it ranks out of the top 20% for the bottom 20% and the innovations they do. But those are some takeaways that I have that I think would be useful at the state level. Great. Um, we're going to move on to a different question. That's okay. <laughs> uh, great. Thank you so much, John. Um, we've had a couple of questions here waiting in the chat. So I think these were back in reference to our um, panel conversation earlier. So first, Catherine from the city of Lowell asks, is there a resource or tool that we could adapt for our communities to convey incentives available to different customer types for the IRA? That's a great question. <laughs> um, there is a tool that I have yet to investigate that the Rocky Mountain Institute has put together that I had suggested that Daniela might help um, municipalities and cities execute, which is supposed to go through all of the various programs and help you identify criteria and then narrow in on the programming and also assess whether because a lot of these grants are very large and they require a great deal of work to um, put together, but then you have to execute them in short timeframes. So understanding where your competitive advantage is in that grant application process is really important because you could spend a whole six months looking at one grant, find out that you're not competitive in that area and have missed a deadline for another agency's grant. So as I understand it, and only based on one webinar, this tool will help town officials as a committee, if you pull a committee together, evaluate all those opportunities and then start to prepare as these programs are developed and, and um, rolled out across the nation. So um, it, but I am dealing in hearsay because I have not had the time myself to sit down and use the tool and, and figure out if it does in fact work the way I understand it to. Mm -hmm. But the federal government is trying to, and and some of these very large climate organizations are trying to offer us the assistance to figure that out. Um, there is also um, the guidebooks published by um, the administration on these various, you know, um, bills or large pieces of legislation. Um, they are, I think, they're very very large guidebooks, so they're maybe a little difficult to navigate. Um, but I found it helpful helpful to, you know, uh, control F and just search for keywords through that guidebook. So I'm happy to share that um, as well. And um, as a part of the sneak peek toward the end, um, we'll have a survey for um, if you've found these types of workshops helpful and what types of additional workshops you would like to see. So if something like a training for that 
type of tool um, is of interest, please make sure to um, convey that in your survey responses. That would be really helpful. I'd also encourage you to not be shy about getting to know your federal and state reps. And if you have a question, or you find something confusing going through the manual or you don't have a tool, they do have a staff and then I found at least our federal rep to be very responsive and her staff to be very eager to try to help us sort through that. Thank you, Sue. Um, anyone else have anything to add on that? No. Great, all right, so we will go to um, another question by Mary. Uh, do the south, towns and cities that just presented have climate energy, environmental justice targets or indicators as a part of the strategies that they just shared? It's a great question. Um, and I think something that has um, come up a lot, you know, these indicators and metrics for really tracking your progress is um, such a key, a key thing to develop. And um, with environmental justice being, um, I think, well, I don't want to say a new newer area of focus, but um, one that's been getting more and more attention um, becomes um, more and more important to, to build on that and to also develop effective metrics. So I will let our panelists um, respond if there's any, any sort of environmental justice or climate justice indicators or um, targets. I think the first challenge is identifying, or as we was discussed earlier is, how do we identify what is environmental justice impact to community or what that population is or region is in some sense? And there's a state chart but that may or may not be certainly of granularity that talks about it very specifically about how to reach mm -hmm. that audience, number one. Um, however, at least in terms of we are cognizant of that, and that's one of the examples I mentioned is in our massive grant to reach out for energy efficiency uh, actions, we are trying to collaborate to reach that audience to a given uh, section, basically, and see if there's a way to communicate to them and move them along, so to speak. So there's not a so there's a both a lack of data to establish a, an indicator, but we are certainly cognizant of that. It's not just environment, that's just community, and it depends on how the definition lies. There's also the usual historical way of where siting happened or some of those kinds of low income and siting of harmful industries or divisions or high traffic zones and other things that happened that in town and there's a lot of questions were asked, being always asked around where um, siting of high transportation sectors happen or um, safety issues happen or uh, siting of other polluting industries or commercial enterprises happen, right? So there's that particular aspect that's handled through the sustainability or through the planning board options in, in general. As I mentioned, there's a sustainability questionnaire going in a little bit of the planning board process for terms, but that allows for a little bit of a review to try and increase some of these concepts just to see what some of those other strategies are. Mm -hmm. uh, but the more important piece, I think, is to start making progress on buying ourselves time. Mm -hmm. As the speaker just mentioned about, hey, we should get to 100% RFP. That in itself is a big ask because you don't get to that level because the price increases you very much. And if every community gets to 100% demand, then it's just a, 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 we're fighting each other without putting the capacity. So I think it's a lot of sequencing act that I suppose then to buy time mm -hmm. to get the energy justice communities. Thank you. That's nice. Thank you. Anything else to add to that? I guess the one thing we've we've looked at is um, we have a tree planting plan and invasive species removal and targeting heat islands is part of that. So it's not always, I, I mean, it will impact the environmental justice community, but we we don't have a very large one. So it's more sometimes addressing those areas, those problem areas that are causing everyone, you know, you can sort of frame it. You can also, I think one thing we haven't talked about is water, looking at development along a watershed or 
environmental um, actions along a watershed. And um, similarly, you can sort of track the, the transportation corridors where you've had more, you, you might want to add more nature kind of thing, but it's not, um, it can be a tricky data problem. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, so another question uh, from Kimberly, um, is anyone offering zoning density bonuses and development as an incentive for the use of renewable energy in a project? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not officially at least, um, but I would say Again, the intent of the discussion that we had had with our planning board with the sustainability question there is if projects adopt higher than normal or are willing to work to incorporate more sustainable features, then there is relief provided in certain actions. Mm -hmm. So um, would it be an easier permitting process or a, okay, you know, we can wave something on, but that is left to the decision of the planning board specifically because mm -hmm. we are in a trial period to go ahead. Um, mm -hmm. But it is a very good question about density bonus for things around uh, reduction in minimum parking spots. Mm -hmm. right? Those are all very good uh, tools to build a more commute or bicyclable or walking friendly communities over time mm -hmm. um, as a piece when integrated with a full strategy. That's why I continue to underline the theme zoning and planning across the entire region and then across multiple regional boundaries becomes very really important to consider. Yeah, I think Westford is starting to look at its zoning that way and Carlisle actually is using the MVP grant program they submitted to look at best practices in zoning to try to update all of their bylaws and zoning with the best practices across the state. And my hope is that would serve as a model for that other communities, once that work is paid for, could then kind of borrow. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, in our roadmap, there's in Westford, there's a goal to produce at least one sort of network solar or network geothermal product with project with a developer. And the reason I, I think these movements about the MBTA and things are coming together to make it right where a developer would find the incentives and the new building codes and the new zoning would find such a project interesting. And that I guess is, is aspirational. I haven't seen it happen yet, but I, I just think that we need to, we do need to build more dense when we're gonna build and leave more land left and we're moving in that direction. And then that lends itself to overlapping um, land use priorities as you're discussing and also um, to denser housing, which then lends itself to these types of communal heating, cooling types of systems. So I'm hopeful. Yeah, in Pepperell, I feel like we're one step removed from that. I think that even the idea of building, I think there are certain areas like in the middle of town where people are okay building, um, you know, with more density, but sometimes it's not always possible to build there, and so we might have to build somewhere else, but I think that there's a lot of resistance against density in general, so that's been a challenge for us, and hopefully we get to the problem of, should we provide incentives for more intense um, development, but um, that's where, yeah, right. But that's the critical piece, as you have looked at your own towns, Greenhouse gas transportation is a bigger piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why the siting, the zoning, density, but services being very close by, yet having a the rural feel that people want to is yeah. a balance that you have to go through. And that's a significant yeah. portion of the awareness campaign. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we're also, as they were talking about um redoing rezoning stuff, um, you know, planning, all that. And there's a lot of there's a lot of change going on right now. Mm -hmm. So accessory dwelling units may be a vehicle for mm -hmm. you in terms of keeping residents, providing affordable housing or keeping residents in housing that they may not otherwise be able to stay in. Um, and therefore, you're 
adding density, but you're putting the character restrictions around it that preserve the character of the town. Because you can say, you know, it has to, Carlisle has done this, that it has to look like a standalone, you know, you can right. deal with the aesthetics through the way you plan it. But that may be a, you know, a baby step that starts to, to gain acceptance. Yeah. So actually, um, how did you know that was a hot topic? <laughs> In February, well, there's now, an so article in the Washington Post about it today. It's a hot topic. <laughs> so that's sort of like the baby step that we're trying to take. And even that's a struggle, actually. That's on our war room now. So it's, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to get there. Well, people worry. They, so again, like trying to bring in examples of where it's been successful to them so that yeah. their worst case scenario concerns can be mitigated by positive experiences of people who tried on that road ahead of you. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. A lot of this engagement and outreach is meeting people where they're at and um, really trying to get them on board that way. So there's definitely, um, I can see a lot of opportunity for, <laughs> for more um, different types of workshops on um, sustainability and housing um, as well. So hopefully that would be uh, of interest and the possibility to, to host um, in the future. That's great. Um, so Christopher responded, I believe, um, to Kimberly's question. We offered density bonuses for alternative modes of transportation residents in new apartments. Um, we'll hopefully have a new bus stop and bikes for residents that live there. Um, and I don't know if Christopher is still on the call. I believe he is not. So I was going to ask a clarifying question of um, what that's Christopher Hayes. I believe this is, that's a, a colleague from NIMCOG. Um, I think this is a, a different Christopher, Christopher Tribo. Tribo, yeah, who is no longer on the call. But um, Christopher, if you see these out there in the in the ether, um, once the recording is posted, please feel free to leave a comment. Um, Great, and Catherine Moses says, uh, we have a copy of the guidebook. I was thinking more of a toolbox for residents and businesses. Yeah, um, I think it would be, I definitely would need to do some more um, exploring and more research on the types of resources that are available and um, hopefully work with state partners as well as other councils um, to develop more of this toolbox that I think would be, um, has been expressed multiple times that would be useful um, for people to really be able to understand these incentives and access them in a way that is effective. Um, uh, that is the end of our chat question. So if um, the remaining people on the call have any additional chats or any of our in-person participants have additional questions for, for each other or for John. <laughs> I, think, I think I'll put out a call, maybe these two pepper line to uh, respite at this point, but, and, and to lower depending. If, if we were to begin a, um, an equal with a solo ice X town yeah. campaign, mm -hmm. would the others join in, so to speak? Because I think solar continues to be, in my opinion, the fastest way to bring distributed energy resources faster and offset. And also try to reduce the burden around what is known as the the lack of transmission to bring in large scale mm -hmm. from outside to then go other places. So it still becomes very local, and it's a very good tool in the toolbox of things. So I think Nam called me not the one to organize it, but at least the other communities need to get together and restart a, a campaign around solar on the rooftop with a significant attention. I think Westford would be very open to that discussion, um, just in answer to your call. Mm -hmm. um, however, we have run afoul of the point that John made earlier with municipal solar, where National Grid said you've hit capacity where you want to put that, and we're going to charge you an extra 100000 to increase the capacity above and beyond the price of the project which killed the municipal project. And in that discovery, the committee started to understand that the last you know, adopter in a neighborhood might suddenly be approached by National Grid saying, if you're gonna add this, you're gonna put the bill. So that's an area where we need MCOG and the state to step in and help us under work with the utilities. So instead of just pushing the ball down the field and waiting until that last solar or EV person comes in and then saying, oh, by the way, you need to pay 
you know, X thousands because you were the last one on the block to do this. That's not an acceptable policy um, position. Right. But at last check, that was what the utilities were doing. So I would put out the call that if we do a solarized mass campaign together, we also lobby hard um, our representatives at all levels and our regional organizations to make the utilities find another way to fund that. Mm -hmm. Or handle that. Right. Or handle it. Yeah. Well, well yeah, it needs to be addressed. It yeah. is, it's a hanging thing that they're trying to pass off. Mm -hmm. And I would rather see a policy adopted than take it out. Mm -hmm. and, and that's more, even though it's just a distribution company that's to do ice in New England or in Africa, that's a distributor is doing that. That's where they are playing the game. Or not just the game, but the optimization and what the limits that they they're failing to address or plan for this problem. And we need yeah. to we need a way. Each town is not going to be able to do that on their own. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that maybe that's where the if we go as a group, as a RPA, new potentially have a bit more clout if, if there are a, a bunch of state uh, reps and state senators that can handle the cell a bit better. Totally. Mm -hmm. I think I would love to um, yeah, continue that conversation. Um, NEMCOG is uh, preparing to submit an application for the upcoming um, regional energy planning assistance. Um, so I think there, there's opportunities in that grant for regionalization. Um, initiatives and would love to have a conversation, I think, with each of the municipalities um, to gauge interest on this uh, this effort and how we might proceed with policy advocacy or um, other such undertakings. Yeah, I think the Sustainability Council would be very interested in seeing how we could help support that kind of effort, talking with Catherine Moses and the Energy Department and seeing what kind of uh, abilities we have to, mm -hmm. to to work with that. We did a solarized Lowell program about two or three years ago, and it wasn't as successful as we would have liked, but it's there's a lot more gravity around the issue now. Mm -hmm. And- uh, Well, the and incentives it, have changed too. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And then just real quick in Pepperell, mm -hmm. we, have it on our list <laughs> in conjunction with our net zero plan. It's part of that. So yeah, certainly be happy to be part of that conversation. That's great. So, uh, please keep well in the conversation. Okay, definitely will. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Excellent. Um, do I see any more, any more questions? Um, oh, okay. Uh, so Chaz says, our master plan states that the planning board needs to encourage renewable, renewable energy in development. It falls on deaf ears with the developers. Are any towns passing bylaws requiring renewables? I, I think um, the answer that I would, uh, not to at least my perspective, from Chemsford as we have gone through this process a bit is to introduce the sustainable questionnaire mm -hmm. and having planning board, if they are the deciders, requiring that as part of special permits. If there's a special permit requirement, then they have to agree to the conditions listed mm -hmm. in, in many ways. And so developers can look at that as an option and, and brownie points being given for, it's a sort of like a, you know, I take this off on your mm -hmm. table, if you do this and mechanisms to bring. This is where I continue to harp on the fact that leadership committees around town need to understand and have a, a whole sustainability course again, mm -hmm. they, yeah. because they need to understand the, the complexity and the, the, the trade offs, the trade offs, and the ability to make moving targets, right? And, and not get, um, not be challenged by people saying, oh, the standard for one was this and standard for something else is something else. But it was a moving target client. As long as the philosophy is well known, the developers will know that, hey, this is a requirement. We actually, in Chemsford, have had a couple of proposals, I think, that have come in and already they have talked about, we want to get the roof ready to be solar ready, or we expect to put an X, Y, Z amount of Well, and solar. part of that, I love your survey. Don't get me wrong. 
But part of that is what we haven't talked about, which is the new stretch code that all the green communities had go into effect and the anticipation of additional um, codes that the towns might adopt in the future. So in answer to this person's question, fossil fuel uh, towns that have, are part of the fossil fuel, no fossil fuel pilot, those buildings will have to have renewable energy associated with them in order to meet the net zero and no fossil fuel requirement. So unless they're an extremely well-built passive house structure, um, they will need to supplement the energy conservation of the building that they, they build with renewables in order to meet the code. So yes, is the answer to the question. Um, most of those communities are Boston or very close to Boston and they're limited to the 10 by statute right now as a trial pilot to see how that will work. And um, the specialized stretch code is being adopted by mostly those communities, but also some other communities. It will not come into effect until six months to a year after its adoption. So those communities who adopted it this spring won't see it implemented until next year, the beginning of next year. And that includes some of the readiness, right. the readiness that we're talking about and the fewer parking spaces and the charging infrastructure in the parking lot, but it doesn't necessarily include the actual renewables. It includes the readiness for those renewables. But if one method, and I'm not ready to say this is the right method, but one method might be to push for a new code adoption. And then if your town wanted to spring for that, then at that point, those renewables would be required. But right, right now it's more of a negotiation. The, the, the clarification I would say is that that opt-in specialized stretch code applies to all new buildings six months after adoption by town meeting of select board authorization, so to speak, as is appropriate for the town. All new buildings, therefore, if they are choosing under that particular, because the green community that adopts that, any new construction, at least for residential, the commercial is slightly different. It has its own constraints. It's a little slower. It's slower, a little later. But, but it's there, is that new developments will be required for mixed fuel usage, will be required to have solar on rooftop to allow such. Um, along with very tight building envelope standards, which every house, if they did that, would be a fantastic both economic driver and uh, energy saver over time. And it's not just new construction, it's renovations over a certain amount of footage. And I, I don't want to quote what it is, but it's a large, you do a large renovation, that code also pertains to you. So if you have a 4,000 square foot house and you redo your basement, for example, you might get hit by that. I, I don't think that the renovations are part of that. That comes under the existing green community stretch code. Okay, so then that's the you're gonna be we, hit. That's okay. the mistake we made in presenting it. The renovations are already covered under stretch code. Mm -hmm. Okay. The I could specialized opt-in code is only for the construction. Made that clear because okay. this, this this particular presentation is focused already. In <laughs> well, I haven't done one yet, so you're ahead of me there. <laughs> we made that mistake in communicating. I could pull out a town model. Yeah. So. Oh, I know. Well, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. <laughs> the the ends of those veterans. <laughs> yeah, that's really helpful. I thought it was part of the opt in. Yeah. If you're a green well. community, that stretch code will indicate renovations. Great. Yeah. Um, we'll take one more question if there's uh, anything else. Um, folks in person or in the Zoom audience. For John, if you would like to also weigh in on any of the, anything that's being discussed, uh, we would love to hear your perspective as well. Um, I'm sure. I, I can add one other thing where there are two ways to do planning. One is sort of top down. Some communities have just said, 
come in, tell me what you recommend and let's be done with it. Other communities have done a community outreach approach. I think a hybrid is the best to do a community. What do you want to do without any documentation is, isn't serving anyone well. So if you could do some, uh, just get some reasonable numbers to start with so people can make an educated decision about, well, what are we talking about? How much does it cost? And what, it, I, I would love to see communities think more broadly. Uh, I've tended to just give the data and, and not do as much community outreach because the community needs to work with itself. And uh, please, please try and get some initial data, like what does it cost to install a ductless heat pump versus a uh, variable refrigerant versus a ground source, and then make a decision what to do. So that, that's the one other thing I can do, but I love this discussion. It's you're, you're hitting all the high points of how challenging it is. There's so many moving pieces. It's really extraordinary. Excellent, thank you so much, John. And yes, I think we're here. We're all realizing that sustainability really is the challenge of the century, but um, something that hopefully um, we can move further along as a team and as a region and with many heads in the game um, and playing with these very complex puzzle pieces, then we can make more progress. Um, so I wanna thank our panelists for this wonderful discussion. Um, and thank you to our in-person attendees and our the folks on Zoom as well. Uh, I think we have a couple closing slides um, just to leave you with uh, some action items here as we are closing out. Oh, let me, forgot to share my screen. Where is the Zoom? Okay, there we go. Um, so as I had mentioned, and sorry, now everything's moving around. One second. Um, so as I had mentioned, um, NIMCOG is preparing to um, apply for the next round of the Department of Energy Resources Regional Energy Planning Assistance Grant, through which we've provided technical assistance to our communities um, with either the creation of a net zero municipal um, municipal buildings and operations plan, greenhouse gas inventory, or a scope of work for a community-wide net zero action plan. We've provided assistance um, to Pepperell with, with that initiative, as well as to Chelmsford and, um, and Westford, and have also been providing other communities with more green communities reporting requirements assistance. Um, so in order to gauge what would be most useful for our communities with this next round of funding, um, we would like you to, um, if you were able to take this survey, um, it's a short five question survey on uh, community priorities, as well as on your opinions on how this regional clean energy workshops have been structured and um, the types of topics that you would like to see covered if we continue to do this series. Um, it will be open until this Friday, so um, you could get responses in. Um, you're free to scan this QR code and I will share the presentation as well. But if you, if you can get it now while it's on your screen, then <laughs> better for us all. <laughs> so um, I will be sure to send it out as well uh, via email in case you miss, um, miss the QR code. But wanted to make you all aware of this survey and um, I think it'll be really useful to hear your specific perspectives on that. Um, there's a chat. <laughs> Great. And uh, and with that, thank you all so much for attending uh, today's workshop. If you have any further questions um, or you know, need need any any other type of assistance, I'm always available via email and uh, phone number. Um, you can also reach uh, Jennifer Ray, our director, via both email or phone number. Um, I want to thank. Thank you all again for attending, and I want to also thank uh, my colleagues who are on the call with us and um, provide some assistance on the workshop. And yeah, 
That's a wrap. And thank you again to our panelists and to John, one of our presenters, um, and hope to continue doing this series. And uh, yeah, we'll see you at the next one. Thank Thanks you all. For organizing. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank, you. Thank, you. Much. thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we'll stop recording.